This episode of the podcast is generously hosted by Progressive Equity Research. Visit their website at progressive-research.com. Hello and welcome to episode 18 of the Desert Island Investor. Mark has just returned from a trip to Chile, but as soon as his plane touched down, he set off for London to go to the Fundsmith annual shareholders meeting. And in this episode, we're going to find out how things went. So Mark, what have you got to tell us? Yes, Paul, given my exposure to the fund, I like to keep a keen eye on it. Uh, It's also an opportunity to meet the team before the meeting, ask questions about certain companies and themes, and hopefully uh, learn some things that all help in making me a better investor over what I manage myself. Uh, It's also a good opportunity to spend some time down in the city and meet with a number of my investor friends and contacts who are London-centric, which, of course, is very much where the action is. Right. You run your own portfolio, uh, but also have a substantial holding in Fundsmith. And I know that you're a fan of Terry Smith and his team. So I thought as an angle within this podcast, we could compare Fundsmith with yourself and see if there are any similarities in style and performance. Right. Well, it's not very often that you hear the names Terry Smith and Mark Atkinson in the same sentence, but I'm game to give it a go. Fundsmith runs an international fund worth £25 billion, with a team situated in the UK, US and Mauritius. And I run a UK-only portfolio as a private investor. But there may be some overlap on the Venn diagram. Uh, I'm a big admirer of Terry Smith, but even if people don't wish to invest in his fund, I'd certainly recommend watching his videos and reading his articles to improve your understanding of investing. Um, it reminds me of the film Flight of the Phoenix, about a plane that crashes in the desert. One of the passengers is an aeronautical engineer, and he proposes the survivors rebuild a new plane out of the wreckage. Now, after much labouring and near death on the construction, on the construction, the pilot, James Stewart, and uh, Richard Atterborough are stunned to discover that Dorfman has only ever designed model planes, not the full size as he had thought. And Dorfman replies to this, of course, one encounters different problems, but basically the principles are the same. I think it's the same with investing, whether it's £10,000 or £10 billion. Right. You initially invested in 2014 at 164 spot 64, and it now stands at 703 spot 85, which I know you're extremely pleased with. Um, and you're always at pains to stress how brief a year is an investment period. But uh, nevertheless, how did the fund perform specifically in 2023? Well, the fund was up 12.4%, which given all the upheaval in the world and the bad news, which for me is the default setting, uh, there's always upheaval and bad news. Uh, This was a very good and acceptable performance. For me, the more important figure is the annualised return since the fund was launched in uh, 2010, which stands at 15.7%. Of course, past performance is not a guarantee of future returns, but it's the best measure we have. And it's just like a football club signing a prolific centre forward. Okay. Uh, At the moment of truth then, how did you compare over 2023? Right. Well, you're asking some probing and delicate questions, Paul. But uh, in comparison, I managed only 2.8%. So you can see that Fundsmith beat me to some tune. Uh, When you think that my portfolio dividend yield is in excess of 4%, then the share price decline even seeded some of that yield. So... Was 2023 a a quiet year for you then? Well, a small percentage variation may suggest a quiet year, but of course that is just an average uh, of the whole portfolio and the the outlying fringes of that percentage, both up and down, are wildly beyond this. Then what was your combined return with Fundsmith and your own portfolio? Well, my useful counterbalance to Fundsmith brought the the total performance down to 9.7%. Now, for me, being a private investor is is not a competitive uh, engagement, but I have previously shared my performance with a number of entrusted private investors, and uh, I did fare better than most. Um, So I'm very pleased with 2023. Uh, Again, I must stress that the the Desert Island concept is a low-maintenance portfolio, so I would have hated to have put in copious hours in in front of a screen trading with all the stress and restrictions that creates, uh, only to have performed worse than I have done. Right, Fundsmith have a a three-step approach. Uh, They only invest in good companies, they try not to overpay, and they do nothing. 
Now, I know that you also try and deal with economy of effort. So on that last point, how, how did Fundsmith get on? And again, yourself in, in comparison. Well, out with the old was Adobe and Amazon, or which you could call tech, uh, and Estee Lauder Cosmetics. And in with the new was Procter & Gamble, or a consumer products company, Marriott, a hotel franchiser, and Fortinet, uh, who are concentrated in cyber security. Now, that is set against a portfolio of 27 stocks. Uh, for, Fundsmith have been higher than that, and in the past have hit a high watermark, I think, of 30. Now, I made two additions and three disposals, one of which was a, a complete exit due to a tender offer. And my portfolio in terms of numbers is similar at 32. But of course, Fundsmith have a wider team to keep the finger on the pulse and, and do deep research, whereas I, I'm just an individual. Having said that, uh, the top half of my portfolio accounts for 85% of the value, which is, is where my main attention is. Um, my aim is to trim a couple of stocks over time and hit the 30 mark, which I think is a nice round number. Uh, I think as investors, we tend to overestimate to a massive degree the amount of diversification we require, uh, especially when you consider that many fortunes have been made by being in just one industry. Think Rockefeller, Carnegie and Getty, plus there are many, many, many more. Now, funds do have restrictions limiting the percentage that they can be exposed, but... Uh, they must have good liquidity. So in many ways, they are forced to have a, a broader portfolio than they may otherwise desire. Uh, this is one advantage of being a private investor. I'm, I'm not, uh, you know, I'm unrestricted. Now, uh, I've never been an active trader, but since I became aware of Terry Smith, this has further concentrated my awareness of over trading. Uh, you're generating dealing costs spread and often stamp duty each time you buy. My thought process is that I cannot control the stock market or the fortunes of any individual companies that are constituents, but I can at least control the amount of trading I do. So Terry gave an example of dealing costs in his annual letter, um, and he explained the duration that he has held some stocks. So how do you compare on that score? Well, Fundsmith have held 10 of their companies for more than 10 years and five since inception in 2010 and they've got a, a current portfolio of 27 stocks. So if I look back over 10 years, uh, I had um, 19 stocks back then, and I've still got seven of them. And using that 2010, I had 16 stocks back then, and I've still got three. If you look over um, you know, the, the, the last five years, um, I've got 27 of my current 32. So, and I had 38 stocks back, back then, five years ago. So you, you can see the greater transfer motion in, in my strategy in that last 10 years, which is coincidentally around the, the time that uh, I first invested in Fundsmith. And what about dealing costs? Yeah, Fundsmith's voluntary dealing costs are just 0.008%. Uh, now, that sounds very low, and it is. Uh, for me, uh, my broker is, is Charles Stanley, and they charge 0.3% of the total portfolio, but this is capped at just £240. Now, in addition, if I place a trade during the month, which is £11.50, I'm not charged a fee. So ever since I've been with Charles Stanley, I've placed a month of trade and never been charged that fee. So in 2023, I paid £138 in dealing costs to service my portfolio. Now, there's also stamp duty to consider, which is generally 0.5%. But of my nine purchases, they were all AIM listed, which meant that I didn't pay any stamp duty. But there is, of course, bid offer spread. So I will not give the £138 a percentage of my portfolios. It will be easy to reverse calculate the value of the portfolio. And this is not a, you know, who can urinate the furthest up the wall competition. But all I will say is, is a very, very low percentage indeed. I understand that Unilever, uh, which we mentioned in episode 14, is the only stock in the Fundsmith portfolio that you hold. Uh, was there any mention of this at the ASM? Yes, it's a stock that Terry uh, has been critical of for some time. Uh, well, not perhaps the company, but the, but the management. And this was covered again. They focused in on the, the past misguided strategy and acquisitions and and pointless rebranding of sectors instead of simply focusing on selling more product to more people. Against that, uh, the estate of 
brands and Unilever's uh, footprints were highlighted, as was the, uh, the change in management, which they see as encouraging. Um, in addition, when asked about which stock they thought could do very well this year, if forced to pick just one, they, they said Unilever. So this is encouraging for me, but it must be remembered that Terry and Julian uttering this is not like somebody having fired a starting pistol and Unilever will go off sprinting. It's not a guarantee. So hopefully uh, Unilever is something of a sleeping giant then. Yes, uh, they put up a slide uh, with some numbers against those strong brands we previously spoke about, Paul. And Unilever has uh, 14 of the world's top 50 FMCG brands, fast moving consumer goods. Uh, three brands have sales of over 4 billion euros. That's Dove, Nor, and Omo. Three brands have sales between 2 and 4 billion euros. That's Rexona, Walls, and Hellman's. And eight brands over 1 billion. That's uh, Ben & Jerry's, Magnum, Lifebuoy, Axe, Comfort, Sunsilk, Sunlight, and Lux. This is a strong stable of brands with good breadth of exposure. Uh, on brands, there was a question, not specific to Unilever, but to the, the fund's exposure to consumer products in general, and the threat of private or our own label. And at this point, the are on duly concerned. It, it, an interesting slide was put up about the amount of private ca label by category. Fruz, frozen veg is an example, is 64.6%. Uh, nappies or diapers, depending where you live, is 39.8%. With toothpaste, whereas toothpaste is just 3.7%. Right, I believe that shareholders can submit one question each, and yours was on Unilever, I believe. Yes, as you can expect, there are many questions submitting, and Ian King from Sky Business chairs the meeting and selects the questions. Uh, both Elaine and I submitted a question on Unilever. Neither of these were selected, but standard practice is that Fundsmith email us back in due course with an answer. My question was on Unilever making their ice cream formulation patents available for free as they support storage at higher temperatures, therefore saving energy. Now, this seems a, a very altruistic act. Uh, now, my view on patents is that they are valuable and provide a moat. Uh, Elaine asked a question um, and about the point that we made in episode 14 about Unilever funding school toilets in India while the Modi government sent the Chandrayaan-3 spaceship to, to the moon. So we'll both be interested in the response to these. Was there much macro focus? Not really. I can only recollect one question about would it influence the fund if either Donald Trump or, or Biden became president? And the answer was uh, not really. And again, I'm in the same camp. I, I'm company f focused. I see macro as a, as a diversion. And despite the, the constant upheaval and problems of the world, uh, which for me uh, seemed to be like the status quo, then, you know, hum humanity has always broadly kept marching on and developing on a, a long-term trend. M macro fascinates lots of private investors. They, they study information and interest rates. They try and predict bull and bear markets, oil charts, money supply, et cetera, et cetera. But at the end of the day, what do you, what do, you do actually do with all this information? Uh, our friend Jeremy McEwen called it analysis paralysis. So, what do you actually do with it? You know, you, somewhere along the way, you've got to try and make some money. That's my primary directive. Uh, on top of that, I wouldn't say I'm bright enough to understand a lot of the macro talk. <laughs> okay. Um, AI has been a major topic uh, in the news over the last year. Was this discussed? Yes, it was. But uh, Terry talked about how difficult it is to predict winners, or indeed, if it becomes widely available, w will there be any winners? Uh, if we look at the internet, the biggest winner has been the consumer. Uh, he's gained access to comparison sites and become greater informed, pushing prices down. Were there any surprises? Uh, what I did find interesting is that the market capitalization of Microsoft is bigger than the FTSE 100 combined. When you think of all those blue chips, BP, Shell, Glaxo, AstraZeneca, the banks, the miners, and others, 100 companies, it's absolutely mind-boggling. But, the, but certainly the, the biggest surprise was, was prompted by a question based on a quote from Charlie Munger, which I, I can't remember exactly what it was. It was akin to necessarily um, abandoning one of your investing principles every so often, to which Terry replied that they were contemplating investing in a bank. And to this was an audible gasp from the audience. Uh, it was like a cinema. Um, 
when the, when when there's a su suspenseful uh, piece of action. Terry has always declared over and over again that this is an area that they would not entertain. So this was really surprising news. So I would expect this unnamed bank must have some unique qualities. And I'm sure there'll be much speculation as to who the prospect is. And if anybody has an idea, well, drop us a line. And I believe there was a question about selling. Yes, have we said, Paul, this is often the more difficult side of the equation. Uh, Adobe and Amazon were identified as stocks they've been sold, but they made a significant share price gain. But that's the nature of investing. It is more the, of an art than a science. We, we strive for perfection, but we will we'll, we'll, we'll never attain it. Uh, people often remember the share that you sold that goes up rather than the one that you sold that went down. Now, the fund has only 3.9% exposure to the UK, and the FTSE 100 has been described as undervalued. Does, does this present uh, any opportunities? Another slide was brought up showing the uh, the major constituents, but unsurprisingly, there, there was very little that they considered offered, offered compelling value given the criteria that Fundsmith looked for. Um, although uh, Compass, uh, who are a food service company, did have a brief mention as having some merits. Okay, so I, I know you don't want this to be a direct lift of the Fundsmith uh, ACM, uh, but more a personal viewpoint. And you've had several points of contact last year. Yes, in February last year, Fundsmith held a series of capital gains tax guidance seminars around the country. I attended the one in Manchester, which was held at the Clayton Hotel one evening. Uh, and this is very much guidance and not advice, but was really helpful in understanding the mechanics of capital gains tax. Uh, there were a number of experienced shareholders there, and I think we all learned something. Uh, there's always a little detail or an anomaly uh, that you're not aware of. Now, this was conducted by Neil Allardyce, who is Fundsmith's private client director, and he did a terrific job. Um, quite rightly, he was at pains to stress that this was guidance and not advice. I think the service has been brought in to add an extra level of service to the Fundsmith shareholders. Um, and this is not something that you do not receive from your average fund manager. Was this just a, an isolated initiative? No, in June, uh, there was an online presentation on inheritance tax and estate planning, again con uh, conducted by Neil. Now, at my age, I think I may be ahead of the game, but this is uh, beginning to be a consideration and something I need to be equipped and aware of before entering that phase of my life. Uh, this was, again, a, a, another very thorough presentation, but it is, of course, a massive subject and everybody's circumstances are unique. Following this, my brain cog started turning, and as often the case, generates more questions. Now, there wasn't a Q&A, but Neil offered as a follow-up the opportunity of personal one-to-one -one meetings. I thought well, it was a terrific chance to investigate the subject in further detail, and again, a free added service, and then Elaine and I decided to take advantage of this. So, did you return to the Clayton Hotel? Well, Neil got in touch and advised that I had been the only person in my region that had requested a meeting, which I was very surprised at, uh, given the value that this encompasses. Um, Neil's preference was to meet in person, but asked if we could do this via Zoom. Uh, and as I was the early shoulder to accept, I, you know, I totally understood that. Now, subsequently, however, he told me that another person had requested a meeting and he would as planned visit the region. Uh, I asked if he wanted to, to meet somewhere that dovetailed with his other appointments in Manchester City Centre, but he came back and suggested for my convenience, uh, somewhere closer to home or indeed my home. So so this was ideal uh, and we held it at home. For for one, uh, it is convenient and also it's a con and controlled environment. There's no noise or risk of people overhearing our conversation, which is sensitive and confidential, uh, should it be held in, in a, say, a hotel lobby. So Neil travelled all the way from the South Coast. Uh, he, we had an appointment time, which I told him to treat as soft, as I know the unknowns of long motorway journeys. But nevertheless, he arrived ahead of schedule. Um, he advised that his other appointments uh, had had to cancel, and I was his only call. So you can imagine uh, how valued that makes me feel, Paul. And was there any direct result of the meeting, or was it just a general chat? I'm not in the business of wasting other people's time or inviting somebody on a, a fool's errand. And this was an exercise we wanted to max out and had a number of preparatory questions. Uh, Neil was very thorough and, uh, and accommodating and spent about two and a half hours with us exploring different avenues. But it was he that asked a, a personal situation about a personal situation and then suggested a possibility. Again, this is, this is, this is guidance and not advice. 
Now, this is a family matter, so so forgive me for not going into greater detail, but this was something that, that had not been on our radar, uh, but seemed an excellent uh, route to take, uh, given our personal circumstances. This is the beauty of sitting down and exploring a subject and, and chewing things over. As we concluded the meeting, Neil stressed that uh, if I had any follow-up questions, not to hesitate and get in touch, which I did, and we've had an exchange of emails, which again helped me with the fine-tuning of this, this strategy. So uh, as a result of this initiative on, on Thunsmith's part, we've, we've taken decisive action, which resulted in uh, Elaine and I seeing our solicitor to put this mechanism in place. So this sounds like pretty good uh, customer service then. Yes, this really adds value to the Funsmith off offering, and I must stress, did not involve me buying any further Funsmith product. This was purely about inheritance tax and estate planning. And this has certainly made me feel greater loyalty to Funsmith, but to be fair, my loyalty thus far has been built upon excellent performance. So I'm, I'm unsure if that loyalty, is it loyalty or purely self-interest? Any further initiatives from Funsmith? Yes, in November, Neil uh, held a retirement uh, income planning presentation, which I uh, I was travelling to Mauritius, but subsequently caught up with the recording. Again, it contained a lot of useful information. And Neil is holding a further series of fund done dates uh, and introduction to, to financial guidance service seminars. And then Alain and I will be attending the one in Manchester. And you'll be uh, attending also, Paul, as our, our, our guest. I believe I am. Thank you very much. Yes, I'm looking forward to the bar being open. Um, so you're always laser focused on costs. So what are Fundsmith's fees? The the OCF, the ongoing charges figure of the T class in which I invest is 1.04%. Now it is higher than some and some may balk at, uh, at that, but I, I'd set that against the performance, which over the time I've been invested has literally been, been life changing. Uh, you could go for a cheaper fund, but uh, you know how have they performed? And remember, you still pay those uh, those fees, even if your fund manager presides over an underperformance or even a loss. Now, without giving too much away, the the fees that I'm paying to Fundsmith are in the thousands. But you know, to, on that point, you know, I've received multiples back in return, and I've the added service through through Neil thrown into the package. So, how much is that worth? You've just been doing some eulogising, but uh, in the spirit of balance, I understand that you have had a couple of administrative problems with Fundsmith. Yes, well, Elaine has. Um, going back to, to 2022, Elaine made a, a withdrawal, and this is scheduled to take four working days after the next dealing day. I think around the fourth day, we had a telephone uh, conversation where Elaine had to declare the source of funds for, from where the money she invested where it came from now uh, i fully understand that this is is to determine that elaine is not involved in drug dealing gun running people trafficking or, or money laundering but i always find it frustrating that the things like source of funds are not queried when putting money in it's only when you have to try and retrieve them i was uh, told that a form would be posted out um now i asked if this could be emailed to, to speed the process up now, I'm always fully invested and leaves a small cash buffer for, for, for living expensive. Now, then, then this was a mistake. Apparently, the person thought that the, the request to, e to email the form out had to be run past the, the head of client services, whereas it didn't. And this only resulted in further delays. Now, we furnished all the requested information, which resulted in a further query, which only transpired when I chased again on this. We got to day 22. And the funds finally arrived on day 29 and Elaine received a letter of apology for the delayed release, it was called the delayed release of proceeds and a small exgratia payment. Uh, but we did have to do some shuffling around to ensure that we had the, the cash available to cover our commitments. Um, just going back to the annual shareholder meeting, Terry made the point that the fund does not attempt to, to market time and, and gave some of the perils of attempting to do so. He's always fully invested. Uh, and as you can see from this example, so am I and always have been. Uh, when the market goes up, broadly so do I, and likewise when it goes down. And that's been the case in you know corrections and crashes. But investing this way since 18 has dramatically changed the course of my life. Would I have done any better um, if I tried to, to market time and jumped in and out? I very much doubt it. 
So I think this answers a question that was submitted by our good friend David Raywood when he asked, um, what percentage of your share dealing accounts do you usually try to keep as cash ready for when the next good investment opportunity rises? Um, he also said, you know, has the percentage varied significantly over the years as you have gained more experience in investing? No, I've always stayed fully invested, but I, I keep a little bit more cash on the hip, Paul, for uh, any money I can't get hold of immediately. Okay, I understand you've had a more recent event than that, though. Yes, uh, last year Elaine, who must now be on Interpol's most wanted list, uh, tried to make another withdrawal. Uh, again, I think this was on working day four, we had a missed call. Uh, the next day, we were told that Elaine needed to, to prove her identity, as Funsmith are regulated by the FCA and must adhere to the uh, GMLSG, Money Laundering Steering Group. I think that's Joint Money Laundering Steering Group. So that day, Elaine, as requested, emailed a, a copy of her passport. Uh, she had to send a, a copy of her holding her passport and a copy of a utility bill. Uh, we received a, an email saying this could take five days to uh, working days to respond. And uh, so this was on top of the initial delay. And in the end, we received uh, uh, the funds 20 day on, on day 20 after the initial transaction. Now, I advise on this reluctantly, as all my other contacts, and, and dealings with Funsmith have been very professional. Uh, if it had been an isolated case, I don't think I'd have mentioned it, but I think it is worthy uh, of comment as, as there's been a repeat. I'm sure the complaint side is a monster given the, the, the number of shareholders, uh, but money is very important, especially when you can't access what is yours. But on the flip side, I'm sure I'd be most grateful if Funsmith intercepted somebody pretending to be myself or Elaine. Any particular thoughts, Paul? Um, somebody uh, trying to be you, uh, mm. Mark, is a is a concept that uh, takes a little bit of getting used to. Was Elaine actually doing any laundry uh, that particular week? She was doing laundry, but not money laundering. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's why that's where they've got the wrong idea, haven't they? She she's got me a, 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 an underworld uh, mafia boss or something like that that I know know nothing about. But uh, an, an underwear mafia boss. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Right. Moving swiftly on. So. Um, yeah, so Funsmith beat me hands down in, in 2023, but as I'm a direct beneficiary, uh, I'm not looking to complain. Uh, let's see if I can fare better in 2024. Uh, in many ways, it's to my advantage if Funsmith uh, outperforms me as my holding is, is larger than my own portfolio. Um, I spent some time ahead of the meeting with, with Daniel Washburn, uh, who I also had a pleasant uh, lunch with a couple of months ago out in Mauritius, and, and he's one of the analysts and, and, and a partner of Fundsmith LLP. And uh, I know it's Terry Smith's name on the fund, his face on the website, his signature on the annual letter, and, and even a recording of his voice when you ring their office. But all the years, I've had the opportunity to, to speak to several members of the Fundsmith team, and uh, I, you know, I've been, a, been impressed with the, with the talent across that team, Paul. Right. Excellent. Okay. Well, that sounds like a, it was a very profitable meeting. And uh, yes, I'm looking forward to coming along with you to the meeting in Manchester uh, soon. And I hope everybody enjoyed listening to this episode. And um, thanks very much for that review of Funsmith. Well, that's all for this episode. We hope that you enjoyed it. Please remember the content is for information only and it is not financial advice. If you have a question for Mark for our Question in a Bottle podcast, just complete the form on our website, thedesertislandinvestor.co.uk. Thanks again for listening. See you next time.